Well, it's an honor to have with me today a gentleman that I've known for an awful long time, and uh, it's a real treat to be sitting right here with Mr. Frank Burns, who is absolutely no stranger to Lincoln County or Brookhaven folks, and probably has had more to do with the beautiful trees and flowers in our community than anybody I know of, because he's been the owner of Burns Nurseries for Woo, how many years, Mr. Frank, did you run that business? Well, it was called Brookhaven Nursery. Oh, excuse me. That's right. It was Brookhaven Nursery. And I went there all the time, and I can't remember the name. So, But you were, you ran that for a many a year, and uh, a lot of folks bought flowers. I bought a lot of tomato plants there and everything. But today we're going to focus on our program, True American Heroes for the Record. We want to talk a little bit about your youth and your experience serving our country, wearing the uniform uh, of, a, of a Navy aviator. And uh, there's a lot of stories that I've read a little bit about, and I've done some research and, and looked up. But, Mr. Frank, you were born in Brookhaven, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I think your dad had Brookhaven nurseries okay. nursery during that time. Is that right? He did. Okay. I, I inherited ownership from him. Okay, so you graduated from Brookhaven High School, right? Okay, and that was. Do you remember what year that was? That was that, that, that was, was forty-one. Forty-one. I okay. So I read something in a little bit of a, a history about your life that you ended up enrolling at the University of Texas. That's right. Now, how in the world did a Brookhaven boy end up at the University of Texas? Well, I did. Uh, I enrolled in the Navy. Okay. I didn't do it at the University of Texas. I was enrolled in the, but I left that and I left the university. And that's when you enlisted in the Navy Aviation Cadet Corps. Yeah. Okay. So that was to allow you to go through the training to be a Navy aviator. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so World War II was already going on, and uh, you uh, decided to enlist. You enlisted in the Navy Cadet Corps, and, uh, and, and then you went through a really extensive, intense training. I read a little bit about what you guys went through, and it was pretty stressful. That's right. It was. They did a good job of training aviators. And I was in it for a long time. I went through several different airfields. That's right. And learning. And learning how to fly. Now, I think your first aircraft that you learned to fly in was at the Piper Cub? Right. So the Piper Cub, now let's, let's make sure our people understand. This was in the days of propellers. These were aircraft that made a little more noise or that made a different noise than what jets do today. But the Piper Cub, I did a little studying on it. It was a two-seat aircraft, one behind the other, and that's what most Navy aviators learn to fly first, and that's what you use. Is that right. correct? Okay. So you flew the – that was the first stage of your training, and then you went to another aircraft. Was the, it the, NV, the N3N, uh, the biplane? You remember yeah. that biplane? Yeah, there was a common name for it. I don't. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I've read a lot about this airplane. This airplane was actually called its its true name was a N three N Navy Trainer Canary, but it had another name. The aviators called it the Yellow Peril. Yellow Peril, <laughs> right. That doesn't sound like a real affectionate name, <laughs> Mister Frank. Was it because it was so hard to fly, or was it? just risky to fly because it wasn't in prop propeller it had the biplane it had two wings one above and one below two only had two crew one sat at the front and one sat at the back the uh the, the trainer sat in the back seat and, uh, okay and the student was in the front seat in the front well i i read some stories about experiences you had in learning to fly and i i'm i'll, I'll I hope you can share some of these because they were really interesting in what you had written. The first one I think I'd like to hear about, if you can tell us, would be the experience you had with a thunderstorm. I think you were flying solo, 
and a thunderstorm kind of came up over the area you were flying. And well, you had, I was flying around it. Trying to get around it. Yeah, I was flying right on, right on the edge of it. And that's when, when I got caught. Got caught by what? Uh, a downdraft? A downdraft. Whew. What happened? Well, I fell about, I was flying about 5,000 feet, and I fell. I hit a downdraft at the edge of that the thunderstorm. A thunderstorm. Now, it wasn't a thunderstorm. It's just a big thundercloud. Uh huh. Okay. So it the downdraft just pulled you down. You didn't have any control over it. It just pulled you toward the ground. Right. That's right. Oh my goodness. I had to stick way back in my lap trying to gain altitude, and I kept falling. Okay, now let me make sure folks understand. You didn't have a wheel. You had a stick that sat between your knees, and pushing it forward made you go down, but pulling it back made the plane go up. But this downdraft was so strong, it was pulling you down, even though you had the stick all the way back. That's right. Oh, my goodness. So what was going through your mind? How how do I recover? I thought I was a goner. Mm. But uh, it got down to about 1,000 feet. And it began to uh, to recover. Recover. Now I understand if I'm correct on this that when you when you're falling like that, you have to push your throttle all the way forward to get enough speed to get out of the fall. Uh-huh. So you're <laughs> you had to do some quick thinking and quick reacting because I'm sure you were falling pretty quick. Yeah. I bet you were glad to get on the ground when you landed. That's right. I was glad. And I understand, I think your story that I read said that from that point on, you had a real respect for dark, thunder-looking clouds. Yeah. <laughs> well, the biplane, was it an easy plane, the, the N3N, was it an easy plane to fly? Or Because it was so light and it had a lot of lift to it, how, how was it to fly? Did you enjoy flying the plane? Yeah, it was easy to fly the Air Force. Use an N three N a great deal, and it had to be easy to fly. <laughs> was that because it was for the Air Force? Were a little bit not as good of, or smart as Navy pilots. <laughs> well, <laughs> now, I'm sorry, that was just my bad joke there. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your flight training. There's something I read about called flying pylons. Yeah. All right. Now, do you remember what that was all about? Yes. That's flying around a, a point on the ground, regardless of the wind, wind speed or direction. And it, and you had to maneuver around this marked spot on the ground. It, like you said, it didn't matter what the weather was, the wind was doing, or anything. You had to be able to fly close to that pylon. That's right. And uh, you had to keep the same altitude. I had a run-in with a pilot on that. One of your instructors? Yes. He wasn't a full Navy man during that time. They were using pilots. Civilian pilots. Uh, civilian pilots. And I, I reported his attitude toward me. He was, he was taking me on a, on a, tra- on a training, training flight and I didn't have such a strong wind as he was. <laughs> he kind of gave you some grief, huh? Yeah, he did. He was ugly with me. Okay, now the civilian pilot was probably just hired because they were didn't have a I mean instructor. They needed instructors, so. Uh-huh. Um, but I think he ended up not being a part of the training after that. Is that correct? That's right. <laughs> the CO sent him on his way. That's right. I turned the uh, I turned him over, turned him in, uh, gave a report of my flight. And I, I turned him, turned him in, and I never saw that. Never saw him again. Uh-uh. Well, I kind of should have asked this question earlier. I know usually because I've I've known several pilots. The first time they solo is a very significant point in their flying experience. Do you remember your ex- first time you got to solo? Yeah, I remember that very, very vividly. <laughs> very vividly. <laughs> Can you can you tell us a little bit about that, Mr. Frank? I had a good 
a good pilot, a good instructor. Instructor, and uh, you fly about nine or ten hours with him before you solo. Mm. And uh, did he just spring it on you one day when you came out for training, or did you know in advance you were going to no, solo? No, he he didn't give you that kind of a, a notice, <laughs> but uh, he was a good man. I've always thought about him and liked him. A lot of respect. A lot of respect. So he tells you you're going to solo. Yeah. And that means get in that thing by yourself and take off. I had got about nine hours Mm. before he said take it up. He just, he walked out of the plane that morning and he said, Mr. Burns, take it up. (laughs) And I did. And you did. That's a, that's I was a... kind of scared at first. Sure. But I don't believe I ever hollered for joy any more than the first time I took it up. <laughs> Nobody could hear you up there but the yeah. good Lord. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's awesome. So the, the, which aircraft were you flying that you first solo in? Was it the Piper or the N3N? It was a Piper Cub. The Piper Cub. Wow, that's awesome, Mr. Frank. Now, there was also a couple of other stories, and, and we're, we're jumping around a little bit on your timeline, but I, I remember one story that I read about that you were, um, you were doing some cross-country training, and a mechanic wanted to fly with you so he could get some hours, Yeah, and, and, and he wanted to fly the plane, and you let him. Tell us what happened when you did that. It was common practice to let these... P- pilots fly. They were in training themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was a black man that wanted to fly. And uh, I, I, let, I told him to get back in there. So he was in the back seat and you were yeah. in the front seat. Okay. I forget. It's been so long ago I forget part, part of it. Well, did he ask you if he could try to fly the plane or something like that happen, or did you let him take the control stick? Uh, I, see, I did. Uh, I let him have it. I just took, I just took, took that uh, as a request. I didn't think any more about it. We were at Peoria, Illinois, mm-hmm. and uh, I just let him have the plane. I thought he... He knew he a little a, bit about flying. Yeah. He he got the plane on a steep dive, real steep, and I was kind of worried about it. Uh-huh. And he got down pretty low, I remember, and uh, I began to get worried when he got down pretty low. And I turned, I turned around and looked. <laughs> that was... Uh, in three in, I believe. Yes. And he had both hands up in the air. Up in the air. <laughs> he was communicating with you that he didn't want to be flying that plane. That's right. <laughs> he wanted you to take it again. Mr. Frank, we're going to take a break right here because there's a train coming right outside our window. So we'll just take a short break. There was one story I remember reading a little bit about something about you flying inverted over the Mississippi River. Is that something you remember? Yeah. Tell us about that, Mr. Frank. Well, that was a, a practice that pilots used. And the first trip over the Mississippi, they flew upside down. So inverted is upside down. Yeah. <laughs> Sound like something uh, the students just got together and was a tradition. Yeah, it was a tradition. For, for all pilots, the first trip over the Mississippi, you fly upside You'd down. invert and fly across the Mississippi River. I love it. Well, we got to mention, because this is such an important part of your life and, and your, your, your narrative and everything, something significant happened while you were in uh, Indiana, because, of course, being a young, and I'm, there's nothing better looking than a Navy man with his uniforms on because they were pretty spiffy looking. 
But there was something that took place at Bowling Green University or right outside the campus. You met someone there. I met my wife. <laughs> a very important part of your life. Yes. So you were a cadet, and uh, she was a student at Bowling Green? Not Bowling Green. Oh, excuse me. It was uh, Muncie, Indiana. Okay, Muncie, Indiana. And she was a student there. Right. At Ball State. I got it now. So uh, you met her, and uh, and a romance began. Yeah, that's right. We were sitting at a, at a place that had four seats, and we had four cadets. And we, 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 and there was also four women. Uh huh. And then a yeah. booth next to us, and <laughs> Kay was one of them. Well, uh, that's 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 so neat because, first of all, the Navy uniform is pretty pretty sharp looking, and and uh, it seems that young ladies are attracted to uniforms. I don't know if that's true today, but. It, uh, but it's really neat that this experience of flying with the Navy would lead you to meet this woman who was to be a part of your life for the rest of your life. That's right. That's really a wonderful story. All right, well, you, you went on some more training. You didn't marry Miss Kay then. You just, the, 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 the courtship was being developed by mail. Yeah, uh, and it it was about this time the war was starting to wind down a little bit, and they weren't such a demand for Navy sailors. You got assigned to a ship, is that correct? Well, that's that's mostly correct. Okay, <laughs> okay. So tell us about your ship experience, because not a lot of people get to do both things. So you you were assigned to a let's see a small uh, flying what they call them flying uh, ship. It was a uh... tender. Yeah, it was. Seaplane tender. Seaplane tender. I'll get it in a minute. That's right. Okay, seaplane tender. All right, so, and it was named? Shelikoff. 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 Okay, the USS Shelikoff. Yeah. Now, most of that was spent in the Caribbean around the, the Panama Canal Zone. Right. Okay, okay. So, So did you have certain responsibilities on the ship? Yeah, I was uh, I was in charge of about two hundred crewmen. And you were an ensign. You were an officer of yeah. the ship. You were an ensign. Okay. And how old were you then, Mister Frank? Still in your twenties, I'm sure. Yeah, I was, in, was between twenty and twenty-five. Wow! Wow! So, how long did you actually spend on the ship? Do you have any idea? Was it a year or or more? Or have any idea? That was a long time ago. I know. Yes, but. About two years. Okay. Now, one interesting thing I remember uh, you talking about was your ship was put on general quarters as you responded to a destroyer that had run aground. Yeah, that's jumping ahead a whole lot. Well, let me let's don't jump ahead. Go back and tell me where I need to be, Mister Frank. Bring me back in order. Well, the ship was based at the Panama Canal. Okay. We didn't go through it. We just just stayed there mm-hmm. for a while. And one night, it was way up in the night, we got a call over the PA system to uh, get underway. And we were. He uh, he gave us where to go. I remember the. The captain's name was uh, uh, Colonel Nash, N A S, N N R Nash, and we had instructions where to go. And we went. It was a group of islands uh, in the Caribbean Sea that wasn't too far offshore, mm-hmm. and uh, another. Destroyer escort was bound for decommissioning, mm-hmm. and uh, he had run aground. Mm-hmm. Goodness! It was it was a whole group of of little islands. Just had shallow water around them. No, and they had turned this destroyer escort over to a 
man that didn't have all that much experience. Oh, goodness. And he just ran, ran into what they call an asshole, H-T-O-L-L. Okay. So your ship was assigned to go assist the oh, destroyer escort. And we didn't want to get that close to what he had run into anyway. <laughs> sure, sure. We just kind of stood out to the edge. Right. And So you were there to assist if the situation got worse. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. That, that had to be pretty interesting and, like you said, pretty embarrassing for the captain of that destroyer escort. Yeah, he, I don't... he probably got in some trouble for that because that's not something that the ship captain wants to do. Well, it would be easy for him to, to pass the, the responsibility off to somebody, somebody else. Somebody blame someone else. Yeah. All right, so you were on the ship for that extended period of time, and the war ended while you were on the ship. Is that right? What? Did the war end? Did World War II end while you were on the ship or at in that assignment? No, it it had been ended. Okay, you had been there. So you were there on the ship after the war for a while. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you, when your assignment ended, well, this is interesting, when, the, when, your, when your ship, your tour in the Navy ended, uh, I, I thought it was interesting. What was one of the first things you did? You went back to Indiana, didn't you? Yeah, that's when I married Kay, the ship. I believe it was docked in New Orleans. New Orleans, that's right. The first thing I did was to tell Kay that we had already had arrangements made that we were going. And you were on your way. Yeah. Well, I got to ask you to tell me about one thing. I want to know about this shoebox of letters. Yeah. <laughs> well, I kept I kept a copy of all the letters I had written her. We were on the ship, and I kept them in a shoebox till uh, till they were all gone. All, all gone. And you did you mail Miss K the box of letters? Yeah. So she got all, and I don't know how many letters that was, but it had to be a bunch of the shoebox. Yeah. So she got all those letters at one time in the mail. What that's, a neat story. That's right. What a neat story. And after we were married, she she keep it. She kept that shoebox in her clothes closet, <laughs> and every now and then she she'd get it down to read them. That's wonderful. That's wonderful, Mister Frank. Especially when we had an argument or something. <laughs> I needed to get on a good side. Go read some letters, Kay. Yeah. Read a few letters. Remember what I used to say. <laughs> That's neat. She she'd get that box down every now and then and read it. Oh, that's wonderful, Mister Frank. Well, we've been talking a while now, and we've got to we've got to fit this into the radio time segment. Any other interesting things that you think our, our folks would love to hear about? Because you're so respected in our community, and a lot of people are not going to know anything like this about you. So you're, they're, you're telling people things about Frank Burns that they didn't know. Any other stories you'd like to share with us? Well, that where I was going around a big old thunderstorm in yeah. a draft. I got caught in a down draft. That was pretty significant, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I bet... After the war, coming back to Brookhaven with a new bride, uh, that had to be exciting for you to be home and all that behind you. But at the same time, it was time to get down to life and, and your normal thing. And you ended up back there at Brookhaven Nursery and uh, took over the business when your dad gave it to you or retired. And, and, and how, how many years did you run the nursery, Mr. Frank? Do you have any idea? Fifty, or or more, probably. Yes, yeah, that's probably about forty-five. Oh my goodness! Incredible. And uh, my dad was already in bad health. He couldn't hardly get going, and he just turned it over. Good. 
lock, stock, and barrel. Good, good. Well, let let me wrap up. I am honored to have sitting in front of me Mr. Frank Burns, uh, who is, is a is a dear friend of mine. And we went to church together for many, many years, him and his wife and my family. And, and, and it's been a treat to have you here to talk with you about your, your service experience, wearing the uniform of, of our country and serving, and being ready to do whatever was needed. And that meant flying in combat or doing whatever. But, Mr. Frank, I want to say thank you for coming in and spending this time with us but also on behalf of the United States of America, thank you for your service and being willing to serve back when our country was in such a tough situation fighting a war. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, there's a, a lot of, it's been so long ago. Oh, I'm sure. There's a lot I don't remember. But knowing you like I do, Mr. Frank, if you had it to do all over again, you'd do it again, wouldn't you? If I had to. <laughs> You'd probably stay away from thunderstorms, wouldn't yeah. you? <laughs> well, thank you folks for listening. This is the conclusion of our program. And again, Mr. Frank Burns has been our guest. And uh, this is Jack Rutland saying thank you for listening.